So, the title of the talk today is The New New, and I'm not going to talk really about technology. I'm not going to tell you to buy this kind of server or that kind of mobile telephone. I'm going to talk about the implications of technology. And so I'm going to start off with talking about what I call the new neurosis. So last week, I read an article. And we'll come to the article in a minute. But the article pointed me at a website. And the website had an article at the top. It was a blog. And the first line was, yesterday I was contacted by an MM reader. And I'll come to what MM means in a minute, because it's shorthand. But let me unroll this. A blog. You all know what blogs are. You probably all read blogs. You may even post the blogs. A blog is a very complex ecology. It's a very weird beast. Because if a blog is working well, then it's a very rich set of feedbacks between the people who are producing the blog and the people who are reading the blog. And where the line is drawn between the people who are producing and the people who are reading is very, very, very blurry. So new things are coming into the blog. And they're getting reported. They end up being on the blog. So that the people who are out there reading the blog are acting as the early warning service for the blog. Because they're constantly finding things. Oh, this would be a good thing for the blog to know about. This would be a good thing for the blog to talk about. This is something that I know the people who read this blog will be interested in. So essentially, a blog, if it's working well and if it's popular, is a community with all their feelers out there. They're feelers, 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 feelers. And the thing about the feelers is that the feelers detect changes. And when things change, that change can be transmitted very quickly across a blog. And that means, essentially, that all blogs suffer from what a psychiatrist would call neurotic anxiety. Neurotics can be identified clinically because they have a low threshold for anxiety. They're constantly worried, worried, worried about something. And so it would seem with this blog, now the blog identified as MM. MM actually stands for Mama Mia. It's a blog where mothers go to talk about all of the issues related, related to mothering and parenting and pregnancy and birth and child rearing. So Mama Mia is a well-functioning blog. It's a very, very, very powerful blog. It's got a lot of readers. And it's got a whole set of eyes that are constantly ready to bring in and capture the latest outrage to the faithful. Okay, So I want you to think, think of Mamma Mia as similar to the Telegraph or really any other tabloid that you might read, but amplified and crowdsourced. Everyone can join in. Everyone can have fun with it. And here's why. Networks, and we'll talk about hardware for a second, networks are very good at transmitting anything that gets put across them. But here's the difference. The human component, that's us, we thrive on novelty. So you can put anything you want across a network, but only if it's new, or it's weird, or it's good, or it's bad, when some new outrage hits the network, that's when it propagates wildly. So, for instance, and I'm not going to keep up with my slides, so you'll have to forgive me as I sort of roll, but here we go. That's the t-shirt. How many of you saw this t-shirt? Yeah. We'll come to why you saw that. All right. The hue and the cry about this t-shirt began with a post to Mamma Mia, which began, as I said, with the line, yesterday I was contacted by a Mamma Mia reader. And the hue and the cry began on Mamma Mia, right here, because the t-shirt is from a company called Cotton On, and there's the article on Mamma Mia. It began on Mamma Mia, and from Mamma Mia, people began to spread the article on Mamma Mia by sending emails around. Because remember, this is a community of people on a blog, and this community of people on a blog are well-connected. They belong to the modern condition. They are hyper-connected. So they can extend their networks very quickly and send their information very quickly. So it extended from the blog to email, and then from email to Twitter. Now, Twitter is particularly well-tuned to the sharing of novelty because something that is novel in Twitter can be picked up 
and retweeted and retweeted and retweeted until it is completely boring people. And so something that's really interesting will get picked up and repeated over and over and over and over again. Now, once something gets Twittered enough, those lazy whores, I'm sorry, I mean those wonderful professionals in the news media <laughs> will pick up the story and run with it, which is how most of you found out about it, because you saw it on the front page of the Sydney Morning Herald on Friday afternoon. Every stop along the way, from the blog Mamma Mia, to the emails that got sent around, to Twitter, to the Sydney Morning Herald, every step along the way acted as an amplifier to the steps that came <laughs> before it. So it went from being a little outrage posted on a blog to front page news in the space of a few hours. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is the new neurosis. And it's only going to get worse. Now, let me give you a better example of what I'm talking about. In 1999, a programmer named John Schwabschinski opened a website that he called TeacherRatings.com. TeacherRatings.com allowed students in universities, basically starting in America, but also then in the UK, to post truthful, interesting, honest ratings of the lecturers that they had in their classrooms. And it grew. It grew, and it grew, and it grew, so that in 10 years' time, after it passed through two changes of ownership and a name change, to become a website now called RateMyProfessors.com. It now has one million professors in its ratings database, and it has eight million ratings. Now, how does that work? How does that happen? It happens because people want to share beyond everything else. Now, here's something. You get, to, you get sold a lot of things these days, but experience is not commodifiable. No one can sell you an experience. You cannot go out on the street and buy an experience, but that's because an experience is something you have to go through yourselves. But once you've had an experience, you are very willing to share that experience with someone else in words. And that's the engine that's driving things like RateMyProfessors.com, because RateMyProfessors.com engages your desire to share an experience. I've just suffered through a, an entire semester with the worst teacher in the world, or I've just had this incredible experience with this teacher who opened up new vistas of understanding for me. Whatever, either experience, positive or negative, engages something very powerful that engages the desire to share. Now, systems like Rate My Professors don't always work. There have been a lot of attempts, particularly in the last couple of years, to take things and crowdsource them. That is, get people involved in an act of sharing around this. And it takes a significant amount of pump priming to actually get this to work. So Rate My Professors took a decade, and it probably took four or five years until it was really going, with enough reviews and enough things interesting that it began to pitch on on its own. Think about it, Wikipedia took about five years before it was really useful to most people. Now, Wikipedia just today crossed its three millionth article in the English language. So that's how big it is. But these systems can be created. You can create places where people can share their experience around things that they're interested in. It may not work, but when it does work, it's inevitably destabilizing. It's inevitably really destabilizing. I'm going to put some very fancy language on it. What I'm going to say is that we have this condition of hyperconnectivity. We can all connect together in many different ways. And hyperconnectivity, we all know what that is because we're all surrounded in it. We're all in a sea of hyperconnectivity. Once we have that opportunity to share, to connect all our knowledge, and to pool all of our knowledge, we now have a situation where we're all smarter for having access to that same knowledge. In other words, once we've actually shared what each of us knows, each of us potentially has the capability to be as smart as the smartest person who shared what they know. So that's hyper-intelligence. We've raised the intelligence of everyone that's hyper-connected. And once you have that kind of knowledge, you can put that knowledge to work. 
And if you put that knowledge to work, you can create hyper-empowerment. You can create communities of people who are, are, have, are punching far above their weight because they're putting that knowledge to work for themselves. Now, let me explain what this meant to universities. You see, universities have been committing a horrible trick for students for at least 600 years. They'll take a professor who's a really, really good researcher, but sucks at teaching. But they have to teach a couple of lectures a year because, you know, that's what universities do. And so students will get suckered into taking this class with this horrible, horrible teacher. And it would happen year after year after year. But you know what? It isn't happening anymore. It's not happening anymore in America. It's not happening anymore in the UK because you can't fill those seats because students are sharing the information. Now the information is out. The information can't be covered up. It's not lost as students leave the school. It's in this constant building pool. So now everything that's happening means that the students are now getting more and more control over who's going to be able to teach them and who's going to be able to teach them what because the students are using their own hyper-intelligence to empower themselves around their decision. And it's not just that. But schools are now starting to poach professors that have high ratings in Rate My Professors. So you want to have the best history teacher in the world or the best film studies teacher in the world or whatever, you can poach them. And so these highly rated professors are going for very high salaries and are going to more and more prestigious schools. So the entire tenure system is now being destabilized by the sharing of information. Now that's just the beginning of what's going on here. Stanford University, which is one of the top 10 universities in the United States of America, took a very bold step two years ago. They said, we're going to take every course that we offer by every lecturer that we offer, and we're going to offer that course online through Apple's iTunes University. So any of us in this room can go click, 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 and start downloading a course in Mandarin, or a course in contemporary theory in English literature, or a course in electrical engineering. It doesn't matter. If Stanford offers it, you can now listen to it. You can now watch it. It is now being shared. And it's not just them that are doing it. Uni New South Wales is also doing it on YouTube, on something called YouTube University. And there's something else called TeacherTube, which offers the same facility for <coughs> secondary and primary students. So, we now have a world where it's not just that the students have control over the lecturers who are teaching the courses. They now have their choice of lectures. So they can now pick and choose. And sooner or later, they're already starting to rate these. Now you can say, OK, who's going to offer me the best choice of the best lecture in calculus, or the best choice of the best lecture in French, or so on, and so on, and so on. Now, That's also meaning that the students are now gaining control, not just over who's teaching them or how it's being taught, but it's now starting to corrode the structure of the university because now you're getting to a situation where you, the students can collect themselves, they can collect the lecture material, and they can figure out who wants to mentor them through that lecture material. And the more that this material is being freely shared, the easier and more likely it becomes that these situations are going to happen in the future. So today, it takes just a bit of work to make this happen. Tomorrow, it's going to be absolutely inevitable. Now, the university as an institution is starting to feel this, and it's starting to melt. It's starting to turn into this puddle of goo because it's being undone by all of the gaps that have been opened up in its institutional walls because of all of the sharing that's happening all around it. Now, the institutions are embracing a generation, specifically a generation who understands sharing immediately. They don't buy any media, they just share all the media they have, right? They live in this world, they are the sharing generation. And so the university is melting down under the force of all of the sharing. And to give you another example, this is one, one reason why Rupert Murdoch wants to take all of the news newspapers and put them behind a paywall so you have to read them. And why Fairfax just last week announced that they want to do the same thing. It's because they're now understanding that unless they hold on to some of this, they're going to be undone by all of the sharing that's going on. They're being undone 
by the sharing. Now, yeah, and I'm just gonna, I'm going. Okay. So, let me tie all of this together to what you folks are doing here in this room right now. To put it very simply and very straightforwardly, you folks are where the rubber meets the road, okay? You are the interface point between the inside of the institution of government and the world outside. Now, in a very practical sense, and to crack a pun, you are the share point. <laughs> Sorry. All right, this is your function, and it's going to be your function in addition to absolutely everything else that you're doing. But how does this work? And the answer to that is there's no one right answer to this. It all hinges on this one central question, this question that undergirds every discussion, in some way, every discussion that you've had today, everything you'll have tomorrow. This issue of control. Who controls what? and who's trying to control what now. In your case, it's always going to be maybe politicians or council bureaucrats who are trying to control the flow of sharing inside and outside of the governmental institutions. Remember, sharing has two faces. There's sharing between the inside and the outside, but there's also sharing within institutions. And institutions are under the same power, under the same pressure to share internally as they are to share externally. Now, different excuses are going to be offered every time a possible situation for sharing comes up. And the excuses are going to be as varied as the stars in the sky. But it all comes down to one thing. Information is power. And people who hold information have power over people who don't hold that information. But here's the thing. There's pressure from the outside. It's already present. And it's constantly growing. And there's pressure to share everything you've got, to share it promiscuously and to share it immediately. Right now, right now, right now. What do you have? I need it, I need it, I need it. Now the pressure from the inside of the organization is going to be to tie it all down, to lock it all up, to seal it away. And these are the two forces, and you're going to be caught between these two forces. Now, if I were talking to your bosses, if I were talking to the people who sign your paychecks, I would tell them all about RateMyProfessors.com. And I'd tell them how very interesting things get when communities begin to share what they know, how interesting and how destabilizing things get. Because in some sense, it doesn't matter whether you share anything or not. The community is going to share it right around you. So the harder that you try to hold things back, the harder that you try to prevent the natural flow of sharing, the more the pressure builds. And the more the pressure builds, the more likely it is that something will come along outside of your control to relieve the pressure. In short, you're damned if you don't. So what happens when someone knuckles on dirt and decides to share something. Now, if you've done it successfully, a community of hyper-connected individuals will form around what you've decided to share. And these individuals will learn a lot from each other around what's being shared. They will form some sort of raw, young, powerful hyper-intelligence around this thing. And that community puts their hyper-intelligence to work around this thing. And that produces hyper-empowerment. In other words, they start doing things. They start doing things because you've shared some things. Now the trouble is, they may not be doing the things that you want done. Now, this is cat herding at its finest, all right? You will be able to suggest you will not be able to control. In short, you're damned if you do. Now, it gets worse. Because everywhere 
all around you, in particular because you're governmental organizations, there are going to be 10,000 neurotic bloggers watching your every move, exaggerating everything that you do, and they're eager for any scent of outrage. Outrage that will be transmitted and amplified before you even know what's going on. Consider that. Now, here's something I want to tell you. The interesting thing is, is that when you set the bloggers off, that is not a sign of failure. It's the sign of success. It's the sign that you're connecting. And any connection in a hyper-connected world produces this, this neurotic reaction. So don't worry about it. Expect it. You don't necessarily know where it's going to be coming from, but expect that. Now, I know that all of this is messy and all of it's bloody, and there's really no way to avoid it unless you're all going to resign your jobs and walk out. I wasn't lying when I started off this section by saying that you're the shock troops of the revolution. You get to be the bleeding edge of government 2.0, a term that we knock around very sort of blandly as it's going to be this nirvana of connection of communities and happiness. Well, that's part of what it's going to be, but part of what it's going to be is you're going to be giving people the tools to be able to do things themselves. And they're going to do things themselves. And those may not be the things that you want done. They might very well be. And so there's going to be natural frictions, and there's going to be natural strengths that emerge out of all of this work. But you are the place, you are the point of contact where this sharing happens. Now, you're going to be pressed, and you're going to be squeezed from every direction. I cannot fix that for you. I can't make that any better. I can do what I've already done, which is paint a picture of how things will be in this hyper-connected present. So sharing is the rule of our time. And so understand the power of sharing, and at least you'll know what to expect when you start sharing. <laughs> All right, so what I wanted to do was to give you an example from my own practice. I want to show you how different the new new really is. And I want to talk in that context about my next book. And I've had to approach this book, and the book is called Share This Book. I've had to approach my book project very, very differently than any project I've ever done before. And I've been working on the basic ideas, which are all about sharing, for about the last four years. And I've been refining it and coming into a sort of a better understanding and refining it and coming into a better understanding. And this year, in the little town of Bandina, I gave a talk for about 200 or 150 of the citizens of Bandina, just normal people, where I laid out all of the ideas about sharing in a form that an interested lay person would be able to understand. And that's it. You know, I just basically laid it all out. It was an hour-long talk. There were questions and answers. And it was just basically a talk about sharing, my ideas about sharing. And you've heard some of my ideas about sharing. So I taped it on my video recorder. I posted, I made, made up a little video, and I sent it along to my literary agent in New York saying, look, I think this is the basic idea for what's going to be a book. He got me a very good book deal a decade ago. So what do you think? Are we ready to roll on a book deal? So. I'll paraphrase what I got back as a response from him, because it was an email. He said, no, 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 and no. And by the way, this is not going to fix the, the crisis that we're having in publishing. So no, no, this is not it. No, there's not a book here. And of course, I know all about the crisis in publishing, because the crisis in publishing is being brought on by all of the sharing that I'm talking about in the book that's going on everywhere. It's not that people are reading less. People are not reading less. They're reading less professionally produced material. We're reading more of what each other has to say. And so whatever that means about professional publishing and the crisis in professional publishing, I can't fix that. But publishing is being squeezed just like every other institution, whether it's newspapers or whether it's uh, universities, and just as you are. So I'm damned if I do. That's what I realized. Now, when I realized that the door had closed, I said, OK, that's fine, whatever. I can still get my book out there. I can still share it freely. I can sit there. I'm not dependent on an authorial advance to write a book. I can sit down. I can write my book. 
and then I can simply share it with people. I can put it up on a website, I can have it at an instant pre press service. Public, the fact that my book isn't being published doesn't really mean a lot to me. And there's an idea behind this that drives this that's one of the main ideas of the book, which is that the more something is shared, the more valuable it becomes. So when you share things, you need to think about the fact that the more you can get it out there, the more hands that you can get it into, the more valuable what you're sharing actually becomes. And this is something else you're going to be presented with, because you'll be presented with, okay, we have to get this data out there and we don't have any money or we don't have any way to get this data out there. Well, you remember that the sharing option is always open to you in your own practice. It's very easy to do. It's very easy to get things out there. Now, a few weeks after that, I was having a conversation with a very good friend of mine, Darren Sharp, and I was talking about what had happened with my literary agent and my disappointment. Now, Darren is an expert on collaboration. He has a company called CollabForge, which actually works with governments. And they figure out how to get governments to engage, so both with the communities, but also inside of themselves. Because as you know, governments can be very silo-like, and there can be a, lot, a lack of communication across them. So they provide the tools for that. And in this conversation, where I'm talking about sharing, and he's talking about collaboration, it becomes very clear to both of us, basically simultaneously, that I needed to go further than simply sharing the content of the book. Because a book that's going to be about hyperconnectivity, this way that we're all connected, a book that's going to be about hyperintelligence, the kind of intelligence that you get when you get people together to share what they know, a book that's about the empowerment that comes from that sharing, that book needs to be a product of those processes. In other words, the proof is in the pudding. I have to be able to eat my own cooking. So, the parallel here is that this is exactly the question you're going to be confronted with when you have to share something, all right? Do you just throw it over the wall and hope for the best? That's the first thing you're going to think to do. Do I just do that? Okay, well, here's my pile of data. <clears throat> Bye. Or do you adopt a more integrated approach? Do you invite everyone else to come into the process as a co-creative? All right? In other words, you're not saying this is an end point, because this isn't an end point. You're saying this is a starting point, and that what we have here is something that we can work with, but the idea is that we are going to work with it. And the end process isn't something that we necessarily know. Now, this is where things get weird, because I had this conversation, and then I got on a plane and took a holiday in America. This was a few months ago. And I was talking up these ideas with some very, very close friends of mine, and I was expounding my theories. They said, great, but what happens to the idea of the author? Who is the person who's pulling this process along through to its completion, all right? Who does that? How does that happen? And I didn't have any good answers for it. And the thing is, that brings me to right where I am right now, and it brings me to right where you are right now, because in this whole process of making this book, I'm going to be engaged in finding out what the author does. I'm going to be engaged in finding out how the author brings the threads together, how he herds the cats to make the process happen. So what happens to the text? What happens to the book? What happens to your projects when you share something? Who's sharing them? How are they responsible? How is that responsibility shared? Is that responsibility shared inside and outside of the organization, inside and outside of the government? All of these questions are completely open right now, and we can't actually say that we have one solid answer, because there are no one solid answers. Every one of these things needs to evolve out of the play of forces in the situation. So, as I say, I don't have any good answers for this. What I have is really answers for whatever happens when you release control and just start sharing. Because it doesn't look like any structure that we're familiar with. It looks very friendly. It looks like there are going to be communities, and these communities are going to be intensely interested in making something happen. You take a look at Wikipedia. Wikipedia is, the, the, funnily enough, the dictionary definition 
of what happens when this process works right. And you have a few thousand people all around the world who are actively engaged in being deeply involved in the culture of sharing. Now, your sharing projects may never reach the scale of Wikipedia, but your sharing projects, as you share for your communities, will gather people in your communities, perhaps tens, perhaps hundreds of people who are actively engaged in your communities. And you have to present the open door, and the open door is more than simply shoving something off at them and saying, here you go, make the best of it. It means presenting an open surface for that sharing to take place, knowing that sharing isn't a single moment, it isn't a single act, but it's a constructive process by which things happen one moment after another. So, we're all in this together, and we're all sharing together, and we're all moving together into the shared future. We don't know what to look for, but we have some idea what to expect. Thank you.